Jeliah, part two. His daughter regarded him with shock mingled with grateful pride. This was the first time he had truly acknowledged her right to take the place of a son who should have stood at his side. The red cloth of her uniform was stained a darker shade, against which the newly pinned badge glistened with malevolent pride. Son's mark to me, he roared. Michelle waited at his side. Who's out there? he asked the first man that skidded to a halt beside him. Lion's mark, was the reply. They've been out there a week. They should not be engaged in combat, Michael snapped. As you say, Defender, the man replied. Michael glanced at him. It was Simeon, leader of Sunsmark. Get out there and relieve them. Send Shumra to Send Shumra to fetch the restaurant and Alamus with him. My daughter and I will plan the delays. Our lives are in your hands, Defender. If we must give them to defend our people, so be it. They were words that exonerated him, should he need to send them to die. God's guide your hands and your aim. You protect our heart. Michael said the words in staccato, his attention already on the gunfire and the terrain. He was aware when Simeon left, but his mind was already on the task at hand. The two marks might not be enough, but they were all that could be spared. Hawke's mark led the caravan. Ibex's mark guarded it. After a few minutes, he turned to Michelle. Fetch the sand runners. Make sure they're fully loaded. She was gone, even as Michael activated the part of his mind that allowed him to float on the wind current over the sands. Observing the battle, he saw the scorpions had outflanked the lions and sun's marks, that the raiders were coming in hard from the southeast. He drifted a little more, finding something odd about the battlefield, but not quite able to pinpoint what it was. He circled again, unaware that the science behind his power orbited the earth and was rapidly drifting out of range. The anomaly on the battlefield became apparent just as the power fizzed to a snowstorm blankness. An ambush. The scorpions had hidden behind a bunker of sand using the red-coloured weight of heavy canvas to conceal them from the approaching suns. They were scant seconds before the entire mark was pincered between the two forces, and Lion's mark was too weak to be of any help. Michael lost no time wondering where the scorpions had found the skill for such an elaborate trap, but reached for Simeon's mind. It was like using a radio, save there was no sound and very little delay. Simeon, scorpions left on flank, body of main force breaking back toward you, he sent an image of what he'd seen just before the power of the wind had failed him. Simeon did not reply, but Michael could sense him responding to the new threat. Sun's mark might survive. He could not be sure of the lion's fate. Papa! Michelle's cry of sudden fear brought him out of his reverie. She had brought the sand runners. They were many-legged droids that looked like nothing more than oversized centipedes, red carapaced and blue-headed with pincers that glistened even bright in the hot sun. They were a bioengineering marvel, but it was their capability to lay latent globules of explosives that made him love them. One of the creatures had raised itself before him and was waiting, but that was not what had frightened his daughter. It was the sand runner that had lifted itself from the sand and swayed before her that had come near to panicking her. The beast clicked its mandibles at her, demanding the same information from her that the one waiting for Michael was looking for. A battle plan. He hesitated. He had not seen what the headman had already recognised, that Michelle had inherited the same battlefield abilities given him, and those abilities were now mature. He did not understand it. It was supposed to happen once every five or ten generations, not passed directly, and never to a female child. The sand runner rattled its jaws at her again, and she looked toward him for guidance. He reached for her mind, just as he had reached for Simeon's before. She was not one of his commanders, and he shouldn't have been able to touch her. When he did, the startlement on her face matched the shock he felt. He forced himself to be calm. No need for panic. He cast a glance at the sand runner. It knew, must have sensed the newly awakened nanotech before anyone else could register. Peace, he instructed. Do as I do. Do not panic, and you will live. After this, I will explain. He could hear the sound of men dying as he knelt in the fine red sand. The sand runner reared, waiting as he held up a hand to stay it. He sent his daughter the data she needed and felt her mind grasp what it was the sand runner sought. Then he lowered his hand. 
the sand runner closed its mandibles around his head. It was a frightening feeling to have those jaws wrapped gently around his skull, but he had been trained to repress the urge to struggle. There was an almost inaudible click as the tips of the runner's jaws found the junction points in his temples, a nanosecond pause as it downloaded the battle plan, then another click as it released. He twisted his head to see how his daughter was faring. Her hands were fists where she gripped the desert sand for comfort and tear tracks streaked her face, but she had remained still as the runner took what it needed, so she still lived. Michael felt something unwind within his chest as he watched the bio scuttle away from her. When she looked toward him, he nodded at her, letting her see the pride on his face as he pointed at the others. The other biodroids had congregated around the two that had received the battle plans. One would lock its jaws onto the head of those with the plans, pause as it received the plans itself, then scuttle away. Oh, sorry. One would lock its jaws onto the head of one of those with the plans, pause as it received the plans itself, then scuttle away so that another could take its place. Once the receiver was clear of the first plan giver, it settled itself so that another runner could take the information and share it. When they had all received the plans, the runners burrowed into the sand, forming ripples that wove and underwove the desert's surface. Together they laid the mines needed to ruin the scorpion's pursuit. Michael's instructions ordered them to cover the desert sand since there was little hope of retrieving the beleaguered marks and no hope they'd try to escape back the way they'd come. Those who had successfully disengaged would flee away from the direction the settlers had taken in the hope the scorpions would follow. The raiders rarely did, having tired of that trick long ago. Michael looked toward Michelle. Welcome, Defender, he said, and saw her eyes widen in surprise. He could see that she had more questions than she could ask and was grateful that she justified his pride by concentrating on the battle at hand. Will the sand runners be enough? Michael shook his head. The scorpions have flyers now. We'll need the discs. And the sky lightning? His eyes darkened with the remembered sandstorming of the picture from the winds. I'm not sure it will answer me this time. I cannot ride the winds. Forever? she asked. Michael shook his head. It was only a matter of time before the winds answered his call again. At least two hours. Too long for this battle. Perhaps too long for him to save his people. He reviewed what he'd seen of the battle, recalling the wind images and scouring them for hope. When he saw none, he ran projections, trying to predict the battle's course. Too short. Even with the discs and the sand runners, the scorpions would be clear of his delays within a half hour. Shell, he said, come here. I have to show you something. She was young, but no younger than any other defender newly come to the trade. Unlike other defenders, however, she was not going to have months to learn to unlock his, her powers herself. When I close my eyes, I catch the wind and ride it above the battlefield. There's probably more to it than that, but the knowledge has been lost to us over time. Sometimes the wind is available, but at other times it is not. For now, it is not. Once I have seen the battlefield, I can remember exactly what I have seen as I saw it and I can try to predict where the battle might go. If we had more time, I would have you try to catch the wind and learn these abilities for yourself. But now, I must show you. Michelle nodded, and he touched his mind to hers. This time he passed her the images he had gleaned from the wind and showed her how he created his projections. She grasped the concept, and he released the mind touch. She needed to try to activate the ability on her own, and his presence would only distract her. Her abilities would not work in exactly the same way his did, but they would work. Michael waited. If they were lucky, she'd be able to use his method of accessing projections to work out how to do it for herself. If she couldn't, he'd need to enact the next part of his plan on his own. His patience was rewarded with a short aha uh -huh of success, then silence as she extrapolated for herself. We're not going to make it, she said moments later. Michael nodded. There was no way the villagers could make the first river. The scorpions would overrun them long before they reached it. What do we do? We call them back, Michael said. But surely there's some chance. Run it again, Michael ordered. 
They won't make the river and they can't make the rim. There's only one place left to go if we hope to stand and fight. Michelle didn't answer. She was running the projections again. When she spoke, her voice was filled with resignation. You're right, sir. Shall I call them? No. The radio will alert the scorpions. I'll mind touch the chief. Pray I'm not too late. What will Caroline say? Michael did not rebuke her. Michelle had refused to call Caroline Mama since the day Caroline had sent them away. He did not blame his daughter for her anger. She might be glad of the company, he said, and his answer brought a smile to his daughter's face that lifted his heart. In spite of the danger, they would be together. If it was to be their last night, he pushed the idea away. There would be no time. He forced his mind to the matters at hand. Leave the discs, he ordered. We'll take our equipment into town now and set up. The marks? There's nothing we can do for them, Michael said, and we'll need some discs to keep the scorpions busy while the others guide the villagers back. Do we know where the caravan is? Keep a lookout. I'll link to the chief, pass the coordinates to you, look inside your mind, see if you can find the maps you need. You can calculate the way back and program a disc to fetch them. I'll tell the chief to expect it. Michael realised his daughter was staring at him. Do you think you can give the plans to the discs? Michelle blinked, thought about it, and nodded. Michael tried to reach the headman. Just like linking on the radio, only faster and more secure. Bring them back, he said without preamble. He'd linked to the man before and expected the chief to remember his mind voice, but his order was met with a sense of confusion. Who? Defender. Bring them back. Silence greeted him. Michael repeated his order, expanding it, addressed the man by his title. Headman, turn the caravan around and head for town. We cannot hold them. You have five minutes, no more. If he was honest, they had closer to ten more minutes, if the marks could hold. He brushed Simeon's mind once more, but the man was too deeply engaged in the battle to risk contact. Michael slipped Simeon the idea of retreating to the town once the mark was clear of the raiders. He tucked it in the furthest corner of Simeon's consciousness, knowing it would surface when the mark commander wasn't so hard-pressed. He tried to do the same for the commander of the hawk's mark, but could not reach him. The man was either dead or out of range. When he was sure he had done what he could to ensure at least some of the two marks survived, Michael linked to the chief once more. I need your location, he said. We'll send discs to guide you. The chief was in the radio wagon. Crumbs. He tried to do the same for the commander of the lion's mark, but could not reach him. The man was either dead or out of range. When he was sure he had done what he could to ensure at least some of the two marks survived, Michael linked to the chief once more. I need your location, he said. We will send discs to guide you. The chief was in the radio wagon. While Michael had been trying to communicate with the two marked commanders, the chief had brought the caravan to a halt and recalled the communications car. Michael had the coordinates in seconds. I'll send the disc shortly. Be ready to follow it. Shell, he called, here. His daughter had unpacked seven discs, leaving the remainder boxed up on the buggy for later use. Michael kept his pride to himself. He had taught her well, but she was anticipating the battle and its needs without him, and with a speed and clarity that couldn't be taught. Linking again, he sent her the coordinates. They turned around, she asked. They will be. I'll send two. One will be lit up. The other will stand by. It will fly dark and high unless the first one becomes non-functional. I'm sending these five against the raiders. They might give the marks enough time to break free. Show me. This time it was Michelle's turn to send her father the battle plan. He reviewed it, suggested four minor tweaks to tighten it and send it back. When she agreed, he started programming the battle discs, leaving her to send the two disc guides in motion. Once they were finished, he helped her throw the remaining equipment into the buggy and kick the small machine into life. As he did so, Michelle drew her sidearm, turned and fired four rapid shots into the sand over his shoulder. In, 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 he yelled, resisting the temptation to see what she was shooting at. She was in the buggy as he floored the accelerator, but she was focused on the dunes but around them and already firing again. Buckle up. It was all the warning he could give her. <laughs>